afternoon, everyone. Um, afternoon. I just told these gentlemen that they're off the hook. We had planned for some rollaway beds and so forth so that you know, we could really test them out whether they're really uh, ringmasters or not. But uh, we decided to kind of skip that. But uh, maybe I'll start with um, um, Alexandro. Tell me in a minute uh, about what you do. And I'll give a minute to all the panelists to kind of self-introduce themselves. Well, my name is Alejandro. I'm from Mexico. I moved to Bali one year and a half ago. I'm currently the general manager at Hotel Catamama, this brand new property in Seminyac that is a beautifully conceived, old handmade uh, hotel with 57 suites. And uh, previously I was working in Santorini in Greece for leading hotels of the world. And before that in Mexico for design hotels. Uh, I ran three properties there before coming up. Okay, Alex. Thanks very much, Manat. Uh, good to see everyone. Uh, I think many of you in the room know who I am. Uh, for those that don't, my name is Alexander Jovanovic. I'm the Director of Development for City Corp Group, as well as the General Manager of the Trans Resort Bali, and we've also recently acquired the Fashion Hotel, one in Legian and one in Renon. Um, to summarise it, I'm a 30-year-old hotelian, veteran, um, and uh, I've lived in eight countries, opened 12 hotels, and uh, I continue to share my passion with the people that I work with. Thank you very much. Amadeo, you, you, you've done a lot more, so <coughs> go ahead. Okay, um, I didn't know that. Okay. Um, but uh, thank you, uh, Amadeo Zarzosa. Um, I work for um, IHG, Intercontinental Hotel Group, and I have the pleasure of um, being on vacation every day because I uh, run their resort division. Uh, so I run the resort division across EMEA, Asia, Middle East, and, and, and Africa. Uh, currently, that makes up about 30 resorts uh, that we have across brands. And uh, we have about 20 resorts in the pipeline, uh, which we're looking forward to, uh, to open. Uh, I've been with IHG since 2002. Um, but uh, when I joined them here, actually, in Bali, uh, when I was running the Intercontinental Bali and started off the resort division uh, from here, um, I came from, uh, uh, before IHG, I came from uh, the Kirzner International, where I was working with one and only and uh, opening up Atlantis, the Bahamas. 2006, a good, as a good soldier, when uh, Kirzner asked me would I like to put a final crown, in a uh, final jewel in the crown of opening properties, I went to open up Dubai, um, um, Atlantis, and then came back to IHG, so I took a little bit of a time off so I've been in resorts all my life. Um, started very, very young in cruise ship liners uh, on Peninsula Oriental. Some of you might have heard the ship, the Canberra, which is no longer in existence. But uh, so it's always been either on the ocean, next to the ocean, on the mountains, somewhere. So somehow I think I always be uh, belonged in resorts. I was originally born in a beautiful urban resort city, Barcelona, Spain, uh, and uh, we're very, very proud of uh, that that place. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. John? Thanks, Manav. Uh, I'm John Woolley. I'm the general manager of the Court Yachts by Marriott Bali Seminyak. I've uh, been in Bali for a couple of years now. If you're familiar with Court Yards, I uh, actually went on the pub crawl yesterday to the one in Nusa Dua. So there's only two courtyard resorts in the world. Um, I'm one of them. So it's uh, yeah, pretty interesting to have both of those here in Bali. <laughs> I'm essentially a sales and marketing guy, so if you've made me uh, do a bed this afternoon. It, it may not have been the finest <laughs> point in my hotel career, so thanks for sparing me that. And uh, I worked for Marriott for 17 years in uh, yeah, four different continents. Right. Um, one sentence is, I'll start with you, John. Um, how would you define your management style? What's your management style? Air traffic controller might be a good way of describing it. You know, Marriott is this very structured company, and we have a lot of tools at our disposal. So if you're operating a hotel overseas, it's really important that people can utilize those tools and understand them. So I'm, I'm trying to help our associates use these tools. So sometimes there's quite a bit of chatter on the airwaves when people right. don't get it, and other times it, it's nice and, and serene. Amadeo, you, you've got a large risk. So how do you, what's your management style? Um, I, I think it evolves over time, doesn't it? I mean, it, uh, it, it obviously evolves over the years. You, you get wisdom and, and you sort of change your management style. But to me, it's all about leadership behaviors. It's, it's about the way you behave as a leader is what makes you different, as a, as a, makes you a good manager, I think. Um, listening to people, obviously interacting with people, never losing focus that we're here to serve others. 
Um, and as long as we recognize that we are here to serve others, you can certainly adapt your leadership behaviors to drive that. Right, Alex? Um, I would say uh, servant leadership. And for some of you that don't know what servant leadership is, it's a, it's a philosophy and it's a, a set of practices uh, that enriches the lives of individuals and uh, also creates a better business organization um, where you, if, you eventually evolve and uh, it, 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 it creates uh, a much better justification and uh, a much better life for all concerned. Great. Um, well, how about you? Well, in my way, I would say that uh, it's very upfront. I'm, uh, I'm, I come from a family that, uh, that I was taught that to treat everyone the same way. So uh, I'm always available, I'm always visible, I'm, I'm honest and transparent, and uh, the way I, uh, I want to share my experience with, uh, with the rest of the staff, as well as from, with my guests, is like uh, just immediate, you know, like uh, face to face. Uh, I'm always based at, you know, if you want to find me in the hotel, I'm always at the entrance of the hotel, you know, this, you will find me there, or uh, when I have another office that is, of course, you know, like in the, basement of the hotel, you know, but you will very rarely find me there. You um, let's say, right. very visible. So, Amadeo, um, how's technology changing the way you've worked? And I want all of you to think about it. So, from the time you started till today, obviously it's come a long way, but how's technology changed? Um, it's, it's, it's certainly changed our attitude, the way that we look at the business. Uh, that there is no doubt about it. Um, I think it's, it's again, it's, it's like, um, anything that we talk about, it's a journey, of a journey that's evolved. It became frightening at one stage because we didn't understand it. Um, and uh, now it's actually become part of our day-to-day -day life. Um, I think that technology is very much something um, that, that drives our business. Um, it's, it's, it's a fact of life. It's, it's something that has to drive our business. Um, the important thing is to use technology for the right things. Um, uh, it's, we cannot lose that the focus when you're in the hospitality business, um, that we're still, you still have to have that authentic service attitude uh, for the customer and be able to have those touch points. Uh, however, technology is a foundation that can drive your business and make your business very, very successful. Right. John, how about you? Has, um, are you a technology buff or how has that changed for you? Yeah, to, to some degree. It's interesting when you work in different parts of the world. If you're in the US and, and you work for a company like Marriott, it's heavily automated. And there's a lot of positives to that. So some of the manual things, as basic as expense reports, it's all done online. You use your corporate credit card. You don't have to do that expense report anymore. Um, but you know, just as Amadeo was saying, it, it's just essential that the human element of, of that is not removed. And I think that's kind of nice in, in Asia Pacific, where you can still make up things as you go along in some respects. And Alex, how about you? Oh, look, I, I think it, you know, I take it or leave it, to be very honest with you. I think, you know, if you, look, we, we're, we're a new hotel group and we experiment a lot with technology. Um, when we first opened our Transluxury Hotel in Bandung, you know, we used IPTV, for instance, and uh, we even connected that with the, uh, the TV network from our Trans TV. Uh, so for the Indonesians, they could watch, you know, the, the premium shows uh, live when they're in the room. And when we opened our hotel here in Bali, we decided that it wasn't really that effective, actually, that sometimes too much technology is, it also complicates people. Because at the, at the end of the day, what does the guest really want? In our opinion, you know, through our feasibilities and through our uh, sort of discussions, we, we really believe in the three fundamental Bs, bed, breakfast, and bath. And, and we, we stick to that. But of course, you know, we've got a star button, which is sort of like a Hilton use it called the magic button. One stop, one button, one service. You don't have to worry about whether you're going to call the bellboy or, you know, order room service. It's, it's, it's one button. So, you, you know, for, for the, uh, for the uh, guest history, I think that's where technology plays a big part. And, and we try hard to sort of make sure that we maintain, uh, you know, very strong PMS, clean data uh, type configuration that we can use, you know, particularly as an independent hotel. We don't often have the luxury as a lot of branded hotels when it comes to you know, communicating through a, a loyalty program, for instance. 
So Alexander, I'm going to try to change it. So if you had to leave your mobile and uh, laptop behind, what is that one uh, piece of technology that you cannot live without? Oh, I think both. No, no, I'm asking Alexander. Oh, me. <laughs> yeah. I think the mobile. So I will, I will stay with the mobile. Sorry? I will stay with the no, mobile. No, no, I'm saying get rid of your phone oh, and yeah. get rid of your yeah. mobile. What is that one technology, that third piece of technology that you have that you would want? Anyone else on the panel? That's a good question. A music device, I, you know, iPod kind of thing. That's important. Okay. Um, you know, the other question I had was, you know, the is the Asian experience uh, getting more Westernized? Um, and if it is, is that the right direction? And I, I leave it to any of you to pick on that. I mean, well, I think globalization is inevitable, but uh, I mean. I think from all experiences, we have to take, take the good things, but still the hotels have to maintain and the places and the destinations its own identity. So the wise one makes sense, you know, to make, you know, cross, you know, take 12 hour flights to arrive places that will give you the same experiences. And I think Bali has a lot to offer in this aspect because of the human uh, aspect that we have here in the island. But uh, I still don't be very careful to, to westernize it. There's, there's no need to do that. Right. Amadi, how about you? Because you said you're overseeing the whole resort side for IRG. Are you seeing that hotels are becoming more westernized? And is that, is that A, happening? And if it is, is that the good thing or a bad thing? You know, obviously we, land, we, we, we run international brands and we have 12 <coughs> brands within our organization. And when you have an international brand, there's an automatic standard expectation uh, from the customers today, even if it's mid-level to luxury. Um, it doesn't matter or lifestyle. Um, so you are going to, if you want to call it westernized, that you are going to have your customers, when you have international brands, expect what you would expect anywhere in the world, which obviously a lot of it comes started in, in the Western world. But I honestly do believe what customers also expect is an experience. And so I, while I believe that there is Western standards um, um, in, in, in your bathrooms, in your lighting fixtures, um, in your comfort of your bed, your linen, etc. I also believe people expect an authentic experience for the part of the world that they're visiting because that's really what makes up the experience. And we focus a lot on obviously being able to deliver that experience uh, because the standards become sort of a mandate. Can I, can I just yeah. tap in on that one? Because I, I really like this question a lot. And uh, um, I, I refer to uh, uh, my own word, which is called Asianess. And, and the reason that I am very strong uh, about this particular point is that um, there, there's so much beautiful Asian culture that exists within our hotel framework. It could be everything from you know, the uniforms that are worn within different countries, of, uh, whether it's in Thailand, whether it's in Japan, for instance, right through to the greetings, you know, the, the bowing or the hand gesture, for example. And the soul of the Asian person, in particular, is, is much more adept to the hospitality industry. And I, I just love that. And I suppose because, you know, and I've been working in Asia for nearly 27 years. So, and I've lived in Japan and China and Hong Kong and all these places. And, you know, I, I just feel that the brands, the Asian brands that are so successful, Shangri-La, you know, and they use their family caring type concept, Mandarin Oriental, She's a fan, and then all the, the enriching symbols and materials that are used with that, even the Dusset, uh, you know, I'm in heaven uh, type slogans. You know, the, these, these banyan tree is another one, for example. Uh, Jiao is another one, for example. So if you collate the value of uh, Asian and the Asian people that go along with that, uh, I, I, I'm, on the, I'm on the opposite of that question, Manab. I, I think. We are not become, I don't think Asian should be becoming more westernized. In fact, they should be exactly like we are saying, you know, keep that, that unique original tradition alive. So uh, I'm very excited to continue to see the Asian hotels uh, develop, you know, even more cultural beauty about themselves. Even the hotels, if you look at it, the way they're designed and decorated in <coughs> Asia is, for me, a lot more interesting than your typical, you know, you know, cookie cutter type uh, hotel. 
So married is a cookie cutter hotel company, right? <laughs> Who uh, told you and, that? <laughs> um, being a married owner, maybe. <laughs> Got me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so how does a company like Marriott, which is so process driven, and it's not a bad thing, by yeah. the way, but how do you, how do you get away from that and well, become the, a... The simple answer to that is we have 30 brands. So if you look in Bali, we have 15 operating hotels. And for example, the Ritz-Carlton Mandapa Reserve, you know, that, that's, it's got authenticity written all over it. Um, you could look at the Bulgari as well in Oluwatu, um, perhaps the, the Laguna. Um, these hotels, they're, they're very, very authentic to the local landscape. My hotel with a courtyard, there's certainly brand limitations that uh, Amadea are referring to. Probably the way I would tackle that is uh, from a food and beverage standpoint, really weaving in uh, Balinese cuisine and other Asian types of cuisine as well. We have a food truck, right, that uh, <laughs> has Mexican tacos, so we, we make Balinese Mexican tacos instead. Right. Um, Amadea, I'm going to... Uh, tap into you because I'm intrigued that you've covered a larger region. Are hotel owners in Asia different from, let's say, the Middle East or Europe or wherever, or are the, are the questions or the problems that they bring to you, are they similar? Uh, is there something unique about the Asian owner? Well, I mean, the, um, looking at it from an EMEA owner, if you wish, uh, looking at the Middle East, looking at um, Asia uh, and uh, Southeast Asia in specific, I mean, um, and we've sort of heard a couple up here today, um, they're very entrepreneurial, um, they're, they're self-made people, um, they're usually extremely wealthy, um, but at the end of the day, while they're very, very proud of their asset, and once they've selected the brand, they're, they're, they obviously want to work with that brand, they're extremely proud of what they're building, um, they also want to see the, the returns. I think probably 10, 12, 15 years ago, uh, they were more tokens of, uh, uh, of uh, something that they had within their organization. Uh, today, trophies. Today, they want to see the returns. So, of course, we have to work much harder uh, to be able to sell our brands and to show that we can make great returns and great uh, for, for our owners. But, yeah, the majority of our owners in EMEA are very self-made people uh, that come from families, typically. Um, so, it's not typical westernized industry, uh, in, an industry where you have institutions. Right. And a uh, question for you again. Um, tonight you're hosting the dinner at Indigo. Great hotel. I've, I think I've been talking about it. Um, why does IG not do more Indigos? Uh, well, we, we have in, um, in EMEA, we have 15 in the pipeline. Uh, we have uh, currently in EMEA, we have three open. Uh, we, have, we have Bangkok, Wireless Road. Uh, we have, of course, the Indigo Seminyak Beach here in Bali, which are all coming to tonight right after this. Paul and me, we're all going to go together. Um, and uh, then we've got, of course, the Indigo um, in Singapore and Katong. Um, we have, um, actually, we have uh, one of our developers here in the audience with me today uh, that accompanied me and one of our design and engineering people that actually uh, very much focus on Indigo. Uh, what, we, what we've agreed with in our organization, and this is not just a cliche answer, but a reality and a fact, and I can say that openly, is that Indigo is a very, very special brand to us. And we've had a lot of opportunities to build more Indigos, um, but we have to put it in the right place. It's all about the neighborhood story, as you will see tonight, how that becomes emerged into the property. It's about lifestyle. It's about being authentic. Um, and if we can't find that right location, we're not just going to put a flag um, in, in the ground for saying that we've been able to increase our system size. In the long term, it will not do any justice to the brand. So we're very authentic to the brand, and that's why I think that we are doing well with the owners in getting the Indigos. Right. Alexandro, um, Mexico to Bali, how come? That's, that's like miles. Well, what was, was, um, before um, uh, Bali was in Greece. Okay. And I just came because uh, I came to visit a good friend of mine who owns a very successful business here. And I came for a month. I decided it was not enough. I had to come <laughs> for another month. And I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. And certainly there's something going on here in the island. I don't know. I can feel it very... Uh, Mount Kalash, right? <laughs> Mount Kalash, exactly. I was telling you, no. So I found... Um, and I think the teachings of uh, working in Asia, in Asia I mean, for anyone that, can, that has opportunity to ever live in Asia and as a manager of a hotel, there's uh, great teachings to definitely to, to, to live here, you know. You have the experience, you know, from America, the American way, maybe the European, 
But the Asian one is uh, maybe at the end of the day, I think the one more, that will be the, more, the, the strongest one, I think so. And have you worked with a branded hotel company before? Yes, for leading hotels. Of the so, so how is, how is uh, being a general manager of a boutique hotel different from, let's say, a full service luxury hotel? Well, there's this, I've basically, got, well, we run the Catanova with uh, basically with similar standards and maybe even higher. So right. uh, it feels a little bit like the same, what I was doing, you know, in Greece before. Right. Yes. So, John, you know, Starwood uh, became part of the Marriott family. Uh, this has kind of made competition a bit more difficult or easy. I'm not too sure the way you look at it, but aren't you literally sleeping with the enemy now? <laughs> no. No? <laughs> I'll tell you something really interesting. We have something called the Business Council. So all of the general managers from, um, from Marriott, which in includes Starwood, you know, we get together. So this has been going on for eight or nine months now. And, and I feel like I've been working with these guys for, for 20 years. So it, it's really good. And, and frankly, I think the philosophies were quite similar for the, the two companies. Um, so it, it's been quite an easy merger, certainly on the property level. And in terms of competition, so who do I have? I, I've got the W in my neighborhood. I've got a couple of four points. I've got the, the Stones, which was a Marriott property. So I, I only see positives, and, and I say that sincerely. Right. Okay. And has, uh, you know, I, I go to, I host a lot of these conferences, and throughout the two days, what we have heard is that occupancies have improved. And not just in Indonesia, but, you know, we had Jasper here talk about it, and the rates are taking a beating in most countries. They're not, or they're certainly not kept up to the same levels. Um, is Airbnb and the similar products having an impact and are hotel companies just kind of brushing it underneath? And, or is that, is that, do you see that as competition? Yeah, on the ground, I don't see them as competition. Um, you know, maybe I should, but uh, frankly, they have minimal impacts to my resort. Even in Bali? Yeah, in so, so I'll have guests who once in a while say, yeah, you know, we're going to Airbnb or we've stayed at Airbnb, but there's clearly a guest who wants that kind of experience, and there's another type of guest that would like a full service hotel with a great breakfast buffet, a bit of a buzz around the, the pool. And uh, fr you know, fortunately, the demand is enough that uh, we don't feel the pinch with, it, with a few people that want to stay in an Airbnb. And that's a kind of corporate line that Marriott takes as well when I speak to one of our senior executives, but certainly from my perspective, I, I see that as well. Right, and uh, maybe with a few drinks with, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Alex, just on, yeah. Sorry, but not just on that though, I, I, you know, I mean, I, I get what you're saying, John, but I, I don't know, I think you can't ignore the fact that the Airbnb business, is, in terms of revenue, is worth about 40 billion global. Right. And by 2020, that's going to be 70 billion. So when you put that into perspective, and you've also got to remember that uh, you know, Asia Pacific is relatively new. And then if you look at Airbnb, there's seven key competitors to Airbnb, you know, like Turnkey and Home and Away and, and so forth. So I think we've got to be very careful as yeah. hoteliers not to underestimate. I, I think, I, and I'm, I'm saying this because we've got two people representing you know, the brands and I, I personally feel that the brands are perhaps not taking, I'm not saying they're not taking it seriously enough, but I'm still failing to understand why rates have stagnated the last three to four years, not in a particular market, but generally speaking. And the only answer that keeps coming back is that at some level, the aggregators are beginning to have an impact. And maybe it's then a cascading effect going up, because uh, if they were not there, that business would have come to the hotels. I, anecdotally, where I've seen a bit of a bite is in cities and big city-wide conferences where in the past, you know, hotels would you know, really make a, a, a killing over those time periods and now Airbnb has eaten into to some of that. So for sure that's had an impact. Right. So Alex, I believe you started a career in nursing, if I'm correct. Mm. So how did you get from nursing to hospitality? <laughs> well, if you think about it logically, there's not a lot of difference because I, I know it sounds weird, but uh, in a hospital, you've got to be in a hotel, you've got to like, sleep in a bed, you've got to have a shower, you've got to be fed, you've got someone who's caring for you. So the principles of being a nurse and 
and taking care of patients is very similar to being a hotelier taking care of guests where you've got the bedroom, you know, you've got the bathroom, you, you know, provide the food for them and you, know, you do take uh, personalised care of them. So the only difference is that in hospitals you don't want to be there, but in hotels you do want to be there. Right. But, uh, no, all, all jokes aside, I, look, it, it was a fascinating uh, five-year career. Uh, I left, I immediately I left school and I, I did a three-year degree in nursing and uh, I specialised in intensive care, coronary care, um, and uh, I, I really enjoyed it. I just didn't quite see the career path at that time. I, I, I really wanted to travel abroad and uh, I saw an opportunity that I was young enough to switch careers, knowing that if I didn't like hospitality, I could go back to nursing because you know you held your, your, your sort of nursing certificate for up to five years if you didn't practice. And uh, yeah, I, I, I was um, I was very lucky that uh, uh, I was asked to um, uh, to be interviewed. And when I did, I was interviewed by a Hawaiian GM at the time, and there was a there was a Sheraton up in Darwin at that time. And um, we opened that hotel, but the job offer at that time was a senior porter's position. And I was a little bit sort of devastated. Here's me with a degree, and I've got a, and I literally said, what, carrying bags? But uh, the GM was a very cool guy, and he just said, look, Alex, I know this sounds weird at this time, but he said, one thing I can promise you with your qualification, um, you know, that you know, if you're good, you'll move quickly. And uh, you know, I was expecting at least a restaurant manager type role, but uh, you know, I, I said no. I left, I left the interview and I said thank you very much. And I said it's very unlikely that I'll, I'll take this opportunity. And I went home and sort of laid there on my bed and you know, those ceiling fans up and down in the tropics. And I thought, you know what, why don't I just give it a go? And uh, the rest was really history. I, I did move very quickly. I moved through front office. And um, uh, you know, I, 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 within three and a half years, I was the front office manager. And uh, so yeah, he was, he was absolutely correct. It, it's, uh, it's all about that passion at the end of the day. And how do you compete with the international brands? Uh, uh, I mean, this is something I just wanted to put out there. Uh, they have the loyalty programs, and how does some, someone like Trans or uh, Katamana, I, I mean, look, how do you I, compete with the big yeah, boys? I, look, I, I, mean, I, I love that question because people do you know, ask me that. And there's no doubt that the big chain players, with the snazzy slogans and the pitchy tunes and the videos and all the social media and hype in terms of uh, being able to communicate with the guests and to reward them with a point system uh, and also offer them the best, you know, the best preferred rate. Uh, of course, we cannot compete with that as an independent hotel. So what we do, again, we, we just stick to the fundamentals. And the fundamentals is making sure that you're cultural standards are what they are. So if you're going to deliver personalised, unique, friendly, <laughs> attentive service, you stick to that. And then you try to find out more information either during the guest stay or upon checkout. There's a lot of information. You've got to continue to be inquisitive. Yes, personalised letters, gifts, um, you know, upgrades, uh, you know, rate parity or preferred rate opportunities, value added package on systems. There's so many things that can be done when you're talking about you know, rewarding or, or a loyalty program. But in terms of just the point system, that's something that we don't have. Uh, but I see the future being, especially with our company, that we've got the airlines. We are 40% shareholders of Garuda Airlines. Uh, we've got the television, we've got the bank, etc. A lot of that already synergizes. And I've got a very strong suspicion that uh, you know, we will probably tap into one of those business units and maybe someone who flies Garuda, can, you know, the points that they're getting, we can switch it over, you know, uh, for a hotel stay, something like that. So I'm, I'm only very uh, optimistic about the future. Uh, I think it's great loyalty programs. I, I, I'm really a big believer in it, but I just somehow think that there's a lot more that can be done at the hotel level. You're obviously meeting the two KPIs your chairman laid out yesterday, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's why. <laughs> so, uh, John. Um, you've got 200 million that you guys saved because you merged with Starwood with the, uh, you know, with the marketing and so forth. So what, what is your perspective from the other side of the table? Do you think independent hotels will continue to be competitive in times to come? Or? I think it depends on the market and, and where your, your source 
a business is coming from. So if you're getting a lot of overseas visitors, then it probably helps to have a loyalty program, you know, brand awareness globally, um, sales offices around the world. So yeah, absolutely. But perhaps in other markets, it's not the case. You know, perhaps you're in a market that's so busy, it doesn't really matter what's going on, you know? Yeah. Um, I think well, you know, one of the benefits as well overall is, is on the bottom line as well with one of these companies, you, know, you talk about the savings, well the, the savings now that Marriott's able to deliver on, with the OTAs and uh, you know, much better commission levels, that, that's great, you know, that, that's, that's a boon as well. In, in Bali with the hotels working together uh, at Marriott um, and having some great cluster procurement initiatives as well, that, that's a positive thing as well. So that certainly gives us an advantage. So you do believe that Marriott gives a stronger bottom line, uh, or I'll, I'll put it both to Marriott and IG gives a stronger bottom line than independent hotel owners? Is that, uh, you know, Alex, do you have anything to say on that? Oh, or Alex? I, have a lot, I have a lot to say on that. <laughs> really, I really do. Because you've got to remember- So who does a better job? They do a better job, right? Absolutely not. So, <laughs> so if you, and, and, and the reason I can say this very confidently, because if I've got a 30 year hotel career span, half of that time was Sheraton and with Hyatt basically. That was you know, a good 18 year chunk out of that. Then about the same time it's been the Mulia Hotel and Cheta Corp. And in between that I just did a little bit of um, development. So, and, and I'll tell you all the reasons. First of all, uh, with the branded, you know, you've got to think about all your fees. So let's think about, you know, obviously, a, Incentive fee, your marketing fee is very, very expensive. That all comes off, you know, from, you know, the. But you're spending on marketing yourself. Yeah, it, but you know, maybe going into a different head. Not really, because like even because a lot of independent hotels are very conservative for like example, print ads, for example. Like we don't do it at all. We won't spend any money on that, for example. So we're very, very conservative. But it's more about you know like. A lot of things, like Four Seasons, I'll give you an example, Four Seasons, they, their IT system is centralised in Canada. That is a shared cost that has to be shared between all the hotels, for example. Then you've got pension schemes that have to be, that come out of that, for example, you know, being an international hotel group, pension plus you've got uh, superannuation, plus you've got all these other, then you've got to think, and this is the one that I reckon is a classic, brand standards, right? We've got brand standards, but, you know, we still have a choice of changing that if we want to. If we want to, we want to make our bottom line look a bit better, we might just decide to change our brand standards. But with a branded chain, you don't have a choice because corporate will control what sort of amenities you put in and there's just a, a certain amount of things that just you know, are a no-go zone. Where with independent hotels, and look, I'll, I'll, I, I, look, I know some independent hotels that, and I'm talking five-star level, you know, that are doing you know, 50% a beta, not GOP, but the beta. So, you know, I, I couldn't imagine any of the, the chain hotels doing that sort of profit. You guys, Amadou, do you want to you want to respond to that or? Yeah, I mean, I, I have full respect for my colleagues' uh, um, <laughs> point of view there. I think it's a very philosoph philosophical um, answer that we got there, uh, <laughs> rather than factual. Um, and and any, any business um, starts with a vision. One trip started into Continental Hotels um, in 1947 based on providing Pan Am um, uh, travelers because the plane had to stop every six hours so they could go into a luxury hotel uh, to stay overnight while they got onto the next leg of the, of the, fi of the flight. Um, the founders of um, Holiday Inn uh, uh, started it because they were traveling on a freeway in, in uh, Tennessee and there was never nowhere to stop um, and enjoy um, uh, with the family, and that's how Holiday Inn was started. So both of those were started independently. Um, they grew, and they grew well. They, 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 they grew to be great brands, as many people do grow to great brands, and they attract certain investors, obviously. At the end of the day, I think the difference between our, my colleague and I, I'm working for, um, we don't own assets, we own a good name, and people pay us for our good name. Now, what we give in return for our good name, we give obviously consistency and we provide a brand and we deliver a promise to our guests and to our owners, uh, to our partners. And I believe in, in, in those things, um, 
Of course, it's got to be a profitable organization to be successful. So I, I think that independence, there's a lot of independents that are extremely successful. And there is independence just as there is brands that are not so successful. Um, but I do believe that IHG is an extremely loved 12 brands. And we are extremely successful. And we charge basically management fees um, in order to be part of that uh, brand. No, but we, the topic is not about how much you charge a fair enough. The topic is from an owner's point of view, who's delivering a higher bottom line. I think um, that that's, that depends as well a lot on, on where you're talking about. I mean, I can tell you we, we have uh, hotel resorts that deliver 50% GOP uh, that, that deliver. Um, and then we have resorts that deliver 30% GOP. Um, uh, and it, a lot depends where you're trading. Um, and the type of trading that you're doing. I don't think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's that easy to, I mean, we have an average, obviously, for our brands of what they deliver. And we, we do know by the industry standard that we deliver um, at, at average or above average in most cases of GOP. So we are satisfied with what we're, what we're delivering. Alexandro, do you have anything to say for Catamama? Uh, do you think you guys deliver better GOPs than if you were, let's say, a I don't know, W or whatever. Mm, well, it depends. No, like they were saying, like both of them have important, you know, point of view. As an independent hotel, I mean, it's uh, <laughs> another different story. The some uh, owners, you know, will go for a chain for a name that they have proper guarantees and standards, and uh, one independent hotel like us will offer just a different experience, also, you know, and a different venture, you know, that. Uh, Eventually, if the product if delivers, it will, it will bring, you know, a better result. Right. So we just had the millennium uh, ses session, sorry. Um, if there was a youngster today who came to you for advice for a leadership position for the first time, what advice would you give? I'll start with you, John. In terms of w what discipline? Or yeah, doesn't matter. If someone came and said, I want to join the hospitality industry, right? What advice would you give? Well, my son, uh, he's... I was saying, actually going to ask, next question was going to ask, you know, if your son or daughter <laughs> came up to you, where would you, would you advise him to get into the business? Well, was, he had a bit of an epiphany because, uh, you know, he was a hotel brat and, and loved hotels, but his idea of being in a hotel ended where the carpet ended. So he did this kind of internship in the kitchen and making beds and stuff. And his his uh, you know, kind of view of hotels and working in hotels uh, ended very quickly. Uh, but uh, just very basically, I, I think working hard, um, you have to enjoy this business. You know, if you don't enjoy that, if you don't have a passion, if you don't have a passion for people, then uh, you're probably in the wrong business. So do you think enough youngsters are getting in? Uh, I mean... Yeah, I mean, in, in Bali, um, I have a very young workforce, and uh, they're thriving. They, they love it. Um, we certainly have um, a, a great talent pool to, to pick from at some of the local universities here. So absolutely. Right. Um, Alex, how about you? Yeah, uh, I love that question, actually. You, you, really good questions this afternoon. Thank you. Manar. This is one of my favorites because I'm not a big fan of millenniums. Uh, it's not that I dislike <laughs> them. It's just that I struggle understanding them in a, in a work environment. Um, I recently read an article and uh, it was uh, talking about uh, the Lusanne students. And it was very, very interesting because um, it was explaining that for a lot of those Lausanne students, even though they were going through that hospitality uh, course or that degree, uh, they were already questioning and saying, well, maybe when I finish, I'm going to do finance. Or maybe, you know, I don't need to work for a boss. Maybe I'll be the boss. Maybe if I just, you know, maybe go into IT, for example. And, and the surprising element of all this is that, and this is a proven statistics, and there's nine <coughs> Lausanne certified schools around the world, nine. Now, 50% of all of those students were basically saying, <coughs> basically didn't go, didn't go into hotels. And they went into stuff like finance, real estate, and, uh, you know, sort of analysis. They were the three main areas. So if you think about this, just think about this very logically, right? To, to climb up to a GM level, it's a good 10 to 15 years, starting, you know, even if you come out of Lausanne, for instance, could be 
10 to 15 years. So, you know, if, if you're going to, and, and plus in that time as a GM, you've got to bounce around countries, hotels, etc. Where if you are a millennium the way that they think, they're thinking, no, I don't want to do that. What I want to do is, like I said, create my own business or get into finance. Because if you get into finance, for example, you can have a very clear, defined objective and a very clear career path that just sets you only in that yeah. direction. And that's what a lot of millenniums want. So um, I, as, as John has, you know, our average age group uh, of the trans is 24. I love working with the energy. I love, the biggest compliment that I get on a most consistent basis is, Alex, you're in a great hotel, you know, this is nice, but it's your staff. It's, it's their friendliness, their attentiveness. They, they, they genuinely, you can see that they genuinely like what they do. They're obviously very happy. You've done something to, to create a happy uh, workplace. So that's the thing that, you know, sort of strives me every day, is, is knowing that the people working in this industry are really enjoying it. And uh, look, I could be coming towards the end of semi-retirement for all I know. Can we uh, have the sound in the back? The people at the back we told to keep quiet. Sorry, it's just disturbing us so at the, behind the stage. Yeah, so I could be coming to, towards the end of my semi-retirement. And, uh, you know, I, I've just got this incredible uh, sensation of working with people that uh, really appreciate and enjoy what they do. Alexander, what's your opinion? My recommendation for someone that wants to join the hotel industry. The area that I would recommend is always the front. Start by the front desk, the reception. You know, at the end of the day, we are... Uh, so who's going to run the back of the house? Ah, well, all, <laughs> for the moment, you know. But if, if you Robots? Wanna, but if you want to, like, uh, say, to get out, like... Uh, That's like, exactly what John said. His son was happy as long as he was with, at the carpet <laughs> level. <laughs> and the minute he went at the back, it just was disastrous. Yes. You but know, you should send your at the son end, but, to him. But, at the end, but in the front is the brain of the hotel. You know what's going on. At the end, you have to make the guests happy. And if you know how to deal with the guests, this is what they most... The so who's at the going. back then? The back, you will have a... Eventually, you will get someone to do the back, and then you will learn from, the, from that side. But I will recommend the front. You told me, well, that was the, the question, where to start the front. <laughs> okay, and after sales, because we sell rooms, you know? So, so I have another question for you. If you were not in the hospitality profession, what would you have likely to have chosen? <laughs> um, that would be the, that's a very good one. I don't know. I think I will work for uh, for a jewelry company. For what? For a jewelry company. I would have jewelry love to work company. for like Graf. Okay. Graf Diamonds. Yeah. I would love that. Alex, you would have remained a nurse. No, no, <laughs> I, no. Because I love this question because I often say to people, if you could be someone that you couldn't be, but if you could be, so. In other words, it's a total fictional question, right? Is there, what would you want to be? Would you want to be like a, a tennis player, a famous tennis player? You could be the richest person on the planet. And you know, interesting, so many people never know what they could be. And I said, look, it's, it's a fake question. Just tell me, it's surely there must be something. Be, be a famous golfer and, you know. And uh, anyway, so for me, it's very clear. Uh, I, I would like to be a, uh, a rock star singer. <laughs> it's true, and the reason for that is because I would be on stage entertaining hundreds and thousands of people and seeing them happy and clapping and joyous. So next year and we'll, we'll bring you back on a rock star. <laughs> and you know who that rock star is? Are you going to grow your hair for us as well? <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you noticed this new, new thing? No, I'd, I'd want to be Bruce Springsteen. That's really what right. I'd like to be. At 72, he's still rock and rolling, and I love that. You're bringing your guitar to the Indigo, right? Your hotel's <laughs> on the way. Um, you know. Amadio, how about you? Uh, listen, just like Alex, I would have gone into entertainment. All right. Uh, why not? I mean, uh, we entertain people every day, so uh, <laughs> you, we probably would do it very well. I've been told that Indigo's organizing a little band tonight, so I think we're, we're getting ready for a, a rock and roll show tonight. Absolutely. <laughs> John, how about you? Are you the bandmaster or you've got no, some other plans? Not bands, not making beds. Uh, adventure tourism. But, uh, that, uh, actually, that was my first job. I worked in the Himalayas in, uh, in Ladakh and up in Nepal, and I was leading tours, and I loved that. But uh, uh. I wasn't earning any money, so I got into the hotel business. <laughs> Still not earning any money. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you do for recreation? I live in paradise. Okay, so you don't, so you don't need any further recreation? Just soak it all up in Bali. 
Yoga, I like, like yoga a lot. Okay, Amadea? Well, up to a few years ago, I played polo, uh, but my wife won't let me on a horse because she's scared I'll fall off and break something, <laughs> and we won't be able to put it back together. Um, but, um, so, r r right now, um, really, I, I, I love just traveling, um, you know, uh, any time that I have free. So, Alex, for recreation, do you practice at the, at the drums, or what do you, what uh, do you think, uh, guitar? Unfortunately, I have no skills playing any musical instrument. I've got a flat voice, I don't know if you know, it's very flat, so I can't sing at all. Uh, so what I stick to, uh, what gives me the greatest pleasure in terms of having that, you know, that sort of balance is, uh, is running. So I, I run every day, I run about 10 Ks, um, and it takes me about an hour, and that's the time that I think about everything, I appreciate the things in my life, and uh, uh, yeah, I've, I'm, I've just finished building my house here in Uluwatu, so you know, I'm here to stay and enjoy uh, Bali, and it's close enough to Australia now, which is great, because I've lived in a lot of countries uh, quite far away, so it's, it's good, you know, I'm looking forward to sort of balancing uh, between Bali and, uh, and Australia in the future. Alexandro, how about you, for, for recreation? Re for recreation, well, since I moved here to Bali, uh, everybody comes, wants to come here, so I have visits all the time from overseas. <laughs> So I basically dedicate my days off to get a driver and get to see more of the island, get to experience it more, do the temples and climb the volcanoes. That's what I like. Climb the volcano like. Right. If there are any questions from the audience, I'll be very happy to take them. Just uh, pick up your hand. Uh, but till then, I'll just uh, carry on. Um, so, Alexandro, if you had to change your job with one person on the stage, who would that be? One person mm. uh, with him. <laughs> All right. How about you, Alex? Uh, <laughs> I think I'd go for Amaeus because uh, I, I also lived in Dubai and I'm a really, really big fan of the one and I know. But you don't fake. like brands. You just said that. Uh, but, you know, there, there was I mean, a part of my know, life. Do you know you just knocked yourself off all the brand guys out here? <laughs> How about you? Yeah. Um, I love what I do, so I'd probably stay where I am, but um, uh, I'd take any of these jobs. <laughs> You've done them all. <laughs> John, how about you? Katamama sounds fun. Katamama like, sounds yeah, fun? It's a cool okay. hotel. Yeah. So, on a, since we don't have any other questions, um, on the issue, I would have loved to have had um, a little bit more diversity on, on, on stage and maybe a woman uh, representative. Um, is the hotel industry doing enough for women? I mean, I was very pleased that we have 25% of the attendance here as uh, being uh, female, uh, but I'm just, you know, I don't see too many female general managers. And John, maybe you, you like to, on a more serious note, have a comment on that. Yeah. Uh yeah, absolutely. From a general manager standpoint, at least for our organization, we recognize that um, there aren't enough. Um, if I go back to the, the roots of this, what, what I see is that out of the people that report to me directly, I have four direct reports, and two of them are, are ladies, two are gentlemen. And I think it's very discipline specific. So if you look at sales and marketing, if you look at finance, if you look at human resources, uh, we have a lot of women in leadership positions. It tends to be more on the, the operation side where, where we don't, uh, which, which kind of begs the question, why is that? You know, perhaps the, the hours, perhaps more family support is needed. Um, but the, the number of general managers at Marriott in Asia has increased dramatically over the last year or so, but from a very, very small base. But uh, right. I, I think on, we need to get more um, women into these operational leadership pos positions and then just by numbers you'll get more female general managers right i'm a dear how about um you know what what i think that we're doing we're getting there i mean first and foremost you know, the how many how many uh, how many female general managers do you have reporting into you in your resort portfolio um we have um in the resorts four okay. right now uh one of them is an area general manager uh, but, I mean, we look at it, obviously, as a wider, bigger company. And actually, we have another lady starting in Pattaya, uh, the Intercontinental kind of Pattaya, at the end of the month. Uh, so we're very, very pleased with that. But, I mean, you know, I look at it from a, the EMEA uh, perspective. 40% uh, of our 
uh, regional operating committee, which reports into the um, executive level, is, uh, is women. Um, so our board is made up by 40% women. We've just started a whole program in Australia and New Zealand called RISE, uh, which we're encouraging uh, women in our workforce that work in different levels, finance, work anywhere, uh, that want to go into operations, become general managers. Uh, so we've, we're finding mentors for them. Um, so we're taking it very seriously right now in Australia and New Zealand. This is probably going to come over to the rest of Asia and the Middle East as well. So, I mean, at the end of the day, it's about obviously putting the right people for the right jobs. Um, uh, and, but, of course, uh, the lens of diversity is extremely important to us. Right. So I know time is nearly up. Um, last question for all of you. Um, in Bali, since we're in Bali, um, if leaving your own property aside, which is the best hotel to stay in and also why? So I don't know who wants to. I'll, I'll go ahead. Como State. Sorry? Como State in the woods. Okay. Um, why is we Como State? Yeah. I think because it's, uh, I don't know, like it's just like a brutal nature in your face and also like it's like this very sleek, you know, uh, uh, feeling of uh, beauty of uh, design of Bali also and uh, it's, uh, it's green everywhere, you know, it's, uh, and Bali color is green, so I don't know, it feels like that. Okay. Alex, how about you? No, there's really nothing that I would say, uh, I think they're also different you know if you take hanging gardens in a boat that's you know really unique but you know I love the ocean so then it has to be an oceanfront hotel so then you know if I took the W for instance I'd say no because it's a little bit too noisy for me so I'm a little bit picky so I'd rather not answer that question you'll not pick anyone so you've yeah, thrown out the uh, brands you've thrown yeah, out I mean, no. Bulgari quite nice uh, you know when it opened up I think I think I don't know the condition of it now you know so there's a lot of elements why it's a bit difficult I suppose I don't stay in enough hotels in Bali to really give you a precise answer. Okay. Amadeo? Um, I've stayed in many hotels in Bali and had great experiences. Um, and I've had some bad experiences. Um, it's very hard to pick, truly, I'm not trying to be politically correct, mm -hmm. it's very hard to pick one specific one. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of great properties here in Bali. Bali offers a, a great... Uh, That's uh, a diplomatic answer. I'm sure really? there's one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> John, how about you? I really love this little lodge in Uluwatu, uh, overlooking the, the sea and above the cliffs. Uh, but I'm not going to tell anybody what it's called. Oh, because <laughs> <laughs> I won't be able to get a room Some, otherwise. Somebody, then. somebody mentioned that to me as well. <laughs> right. It's only like four rooms or something, isn't it? Yeah. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank and uh, thank you for coming. And, uh, yep. Thank you, Mark. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> so.